What happened to him? Stupid idiot. I know all that. He took the barmaid to the mine and somehow managed to let her get knocked off. Knocked off? She's dead? The dark cat girl? I don't know. Maybe the cougar got her. There wasn't any cougar. I saw this thing and I saw this egg right down in the shaft where I planted the charge. and ghouls and welcome back to monster craze memoirs a generational podcast about b movies i am your host ian garcia and joining me as always is my father rocco hello so we're still on our in between season break i'm still going to be taking a little bit of time to make sure that i can rest up but also do sufficient research for this coming season Obviously, when we come back, we're going to take a month to look into one of our favorite subgenres of the classic B sci-fi movies, that being the big bug picture. And following that, I want to jump right back into the universal legacy of horror movies. We'll be speeding along into the 1940s and to look into the films that were made during that period. But in the meantime, it seemed appropriate, and I guess it's coming better late than never, uh, to do a special episode or a special series of episodes, and in memoriam for uh, writer, director, and uh, editor Monty Hellman. Now, Monty Hellman is not a name uh, in terms of the legacy of what we call New Hollywood, the the film revolution in American filmmaking that began more or less in the mid-60s and continued throughout the 70s before the takeover of the modern high-concept blockbuster in the 80s. He, he's certainly not a household name like uh, Martin Scorsese or Francis Ford Coppola. He doesn't have a... a, a a, a taxi driver or a godfather to his name, but he's also not very well known among the B tier of the what we might call the B tier of the new Hollywood filmmakers. He's not even necessarily on the same level of notoriety as your Peter Bogdanovich or your Robert Altman, uh, but Monty Hellman remains a very prolific figure. And in the decades since he made most of his films, you know, unlike a lot of his contemporaries during the new Hollywood period, there was never really a breakthrough moment for Monty Hellman. He would continue to struggle to get his very iconoclastic films made uh, more or less after 1978 except for a couple of films, he more or less drops off the map as far as a filmmaker. In fact, I think it's safe to say that uh, more of the newer generation of film buffs, or at least the ones who sort of came of age uh, in the late 90s and the early aughts, probably will be most... the His output that will probably be most familiar to them will be uh, Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino's first film, which Monty Hellman served as an executive producer for. Uh, Monty Hellman is frequently cited by Quentin Tarantino as a major uh, creative and artistic influence. He's, you know, he's not the biggest name as far as new Hollywood auteurs, but nonetheless, his stature and his critical acclaim, at least in the United States, has only increased in the subsequent decades as his movies have gone from being largely ignored in the time in which they were made to being certified cult hits. You know, it, it, I think it would be safe to say that any writer uh, or any critic who is dealing in the films of the late 60s and the 70s of the new Hollywood period, anybody who neglects to mention Monty Hellman as a creative force 
is necessarily, even though he isn't necessarily historically influential at the time he made his films, you know, to not mention him as being among the best directors of the new Hollywood period is to do a significant disservice to the legacy of cinema. Uh, There's this one really appropriate quote that I found in regards to where Monty Hellman places in terms of the history of the sort of uh, the kind of American, the Renaissance in American filmmaking that occurred during what is known as the new Hollywood period. You know, that period in which you saw a lot more filmmakers who came out of film schools, whether mostly located in metropolitan New York or in Southern California, you know, this new generation of filmmakers who were much more influenced by uh, foreign films and particularly European art house cinema, the French New Wave and Italian neorealist cinema in particular, among whom are Scorsese and Coppola and Altman and all the others. Of all of those filmmakers, whoever we're talking about, uh, having been able to now see Hellman's films, because I must admit that I was not really, uh, I had never really seen any of his movies with the exception of the first one, which we'll be talking about for this episode. In terms of their, the uh, influence on European cinema on these filmmakers, uh, and finally having the opportunity to see Hellman's movies, I think it's safe to say that the influence of European art house cinema upon American cinema during the 70s, a lot of it, there's there's almost a superficial quality to a lot of it. I, I think maybe it just has something to do with maybe the cultural impetus of or the sort of like or of the sort of subliminal motivation that stirs artists that come out of an American context where there's more of an instinct for provocation, more of an instinct for a kind of hyper individualism of distinguishing oneself uh, rather than necessarily uh, philosophically challenging the spectator. Now, I think, you know, there were many great films that came out of the new Hollywood period, but I I think this quote from the uh, writer Kent Jones in this uh, writing about the films of Monty Hellman in the 2004 collection, The Last Great American Picture Show, New Hollywood Cinema in the 1970s, and he talks about the kind of more substantive way that Hellman's filmmaking reflects the spirit rather than merely the kind of provocative aesthetic of the European influence in American cinema, that there's something about Hellman's films that just, on a deeper emotional level, are a lot less visceral and a lot more intellectual and uh, uh, cerebral in nature and uh, this, the quote is really, it's comparing, you know, Hellman's work with, uh, you know, what is frequently cited as one of the major films of the new Hollywood era, era the one that really kicks it off, The Graduate. So, uh, quote, Americans, or rather Hollywood executives, prefer their European influences to be more, to be ornamental rather than structural or thematic. And Mike Nichols' The Graduate, which offers itself as a Europeanized object, is a case in point. Its catalog of borrowings from René, Bergman, and Fellini is central to its identity and its aesthetic, such as it is. Nichols' film, which Hellman greatly admired for the way it struck a nerve in American culture, was made around the same time as the Westerns, uh, that being Hellman's Westerns, and was probably the model for... American cinema in years to come. It fetishized its influences in order to identify itself as a classy, provocative, and advanced film. It came with a shiny badge of cultural approval pinned to its lapel. Hellman's films may not have jumped into the cultural fray with as much of a splash as The Graduate, but 30 years later, they are as fresh and as modern as the day they were made, whereas the high-profile movie that won all the awards has become a relic. 
these two small, unassuming Westerns seem as definitively European as the Mike Nichols paste up, but on a more vital level. As far as these, this series of episodes we'll be doing, the we'll, in our second episode, we'll be getting into those Westerns that Jones mentions, those being the shooting and ride in the whirlwind. Uh, but I think he he makes a good point, and we I think we will in general see it even as we review two of Hellman's earlier, much more modest, low budget films. L- much less, uh, you know, the, the films we'll be reviewing for this episode are going to be the ones that are much more born out of the culture and the economy of exploitation cinema rather than his westerns, which I feel are much more obviously a part of a new cultural movement in American cinema. But I think Jones makes a good point there, where even as we're watching Hellman's westerns, there is a certain extent to which he's not Unlike Nichols with The Graduate, you know, unlike a lot of the uh, new Hollywood filmmakers, unlike, say, Arthur Penn with Bonnie and Clyde, you know. But still good movies. Still good movies, Mm -hmm. but but there's something to be said for the fact that when you see Hellman's films, the thing that strikes you is that he definitely has an overt, distinct style but he's not a style list. Right. He doesn't he doesn't persistently aesthetically provoke the spectator. He doesn't borrow heavily from shot compositions or choices of editing. So for in the case of Easy Rider, Dennis Hopper's film, you know, you see in the editing the transitions in those films the obvious reference to Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, where in the in the transitions between scenes, they will actually, you know, almost subliminally cut back and forth between one scene and another in a way that is, for an American audience is obviously a very sort of provocative, distantiating thing to do. It's sort of a thing that reminds you of the artificiality of the film but seems rather to be done for purely uh, aesthetic reasons, Mm -hmm. as opposed to Breathless, where it feels like, you know, as opposed to Easy Rider, which is much more of a kind of languid, you know, uh, acid, trippy kind of road movie, Mm -hmm. as opposed to Breathless, which really is a kind of erratic, you know, born out of the kind of... uh, unrest of the Paris youth movements and the early sort of Marxist student movements of Paris at the time, the anti-establishmentism of of France during this period. You know, those editing choices speak to a philosophical uh, change as much as an aesthetic one in terms of what those filmmakers are doing. Hellman doesn't really rip anybody off, and yet... I think it's safe to say that, you know, and it is true that those Westerns that Jones mentions, the shooting and ride in the whirlwind, the fact is, is that, you know, they failed to find mainstream distribution in America, except for, you know, they became sort of cult films due to their occasional showings on TV and their occasional screenings at film festivals and on college campuses but for the most part, they were huge hits abroad, especially in France. They were, you know, Hellman is a filmmaker who was embraced by the foreign critical establishment. But in America, his movies are, in fact, so different that they don't even fit within the lexicon of new Hollywood, that, you know, this supposedly new challenging yeah. moment, even at this paradigm, this ostensive paradigm shift in American filmmaking, even here, Hellman is just too ahead of his time. He is too right. out there. Right. It's it's almost ageless in a way, right? Where, yeah. Like you said, the rest of them, the light that fall into the, the, not trash bin, but into a bin, certainly, like The Graduate. But you see some films that do retain a, have a quirkiness to them, 
one of the writers that did one of Hellman's movies, um, like for example, Five Easy Pieces. Those are yes. kind of yeah. those kinds of films are have that kind of quirkiness to them, but still not as good as as or as how do you say um, that uh, transcend time like the films that we were looking at. I think that these these are really something that you it goes what you're saying that they don't really cap they don't really copy anything nor do they pretend to be an aesthetic choice they just seem to be something that's done for utilitarian purposes and he does it quite well artistically it's fascinating to see you know especially now that we've been reviewing these films to see his pro his uh progression as a filmmaker as he's able in this sort of brief period in the 60s and the 70s to be more independent and to articulate his vision more fully it is fascinating to watch purely to, you know, it, it, he, you know, and I think you're right, like, the, the, precisely the thing that I think could define a lot of the new Hollywood films, especially in their kind of blurring the lines between, like, extreme maudlin subject matter or themes of, like, malaise or ennui about living in America at this point of pivotal change, counterbalanced with a with an almost kind of snarky and uh uh almost uh, uh almost nihilistic uh absolutely form of nihilistic is the right word I was looking humor. for what you're saying you know yes. like i yep. think yep. i think mash is a perfect example of that as for as far as like you know i mean maybe it's more of an obvious collision there but you also you, you see it throughout a lot of the early new hollywood films mm -hmm. at least before the late 70s but, Nihilis but nihilistic and isolationism in yeah way. characters that are uh, have problems and uh, they're never resolved right so right. you get that kind of feeling here but not in these hell, movies yeah really. well i yeah, mean it, it, well hell it, that's the thing hellman's films don't have right. quirks right. quirks to them right they're very they're almost and that's the thing in as much as they're ahead of their time the, almost the thing that sort of spells Hellman's doom as a filmmaker during this period when he should have had all of the opportunities as any of his other contemporaries, the thing that kind of spells his exile from the mainstream film industry is that is precisely this weird way in which he's almost also, for also being ahead of his time, he's also too traditionalist. He's also too... Uh, you know, wedded to a very no nonsense way of going about making a film, and you know, I I've read several interviews with him just doing research for the project, and you know, various times during the interviews, like you know, you know, interviewers were asking, well, what did you intend by this choice, or what was your vision when you were setting up the shot this way, and his frequent answer is always. Well, when you're making a film, you don't really think about it in those terms because you're you're just telling a story. You're making the movie and you, you know, it's like, you know, and it's weird because it's he, like expressionism art. Right. And the the genius is what emerges at the at the peak of, of when you're doing it at right at the, right at the time you're doing it. And being creative at that moment, not even thinking about it, but just right. doing... And being asked yeah. to explain it almost, like, dilutes it somehow. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, it's like, could you explain... Like, you, it's like you're asking to explain the soul. Exactly. Like, like right. how, can I, right. how can I explain to you why, you know, how can I explain to you why Jackson Pollock chooses to paint the way he paints? How can right. I explain... Well, a lot of it was accidental, but go ahead. Well, yeah, you know, but... And so, I think... And so, you know, for me as somebody who really hadn't seen Monty Hellman's films before, it, with the exception of his first film, which we'll be covering for this episode, this really has been kind of a revelation to me just in terms of, you know, it's like, and obviously this is better late than never, you know, Hellman had a, had a, frankly, he had a rather unceremonious death, you know, he, uh, on April 19th, he sustained a fall at his home in uh, in Palm Desert, California. He died the next day at the Eisenhower Medi Medical Center in Rancho Mirage, California. He was 91 years old. In between him getting started in filmmaking in the late 50s and his death in 
2021, he directed only 11 complete motion pictures. And, you know, the biggest gap in his filmography, you know, is between, you know, just to give an impression of where his career went as opposed to many of his contemporaries, many of whom, even if they had sort of low points in their careers, eventually experienced some sort of revival, you know, uh, some sort of new uh, 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 vi mm. vitality in their careers. You know, the biggest gap in his career was between 1989 and 2010. And, you know, 2010 being his most recent complete film, which was Road to Nowhere. And the last complete film he made before that was Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. Hmm. You know, so that gives an impression. And, I, you know, maybe even that's a bit appropriate because, you know, I guess, that you know, as we're sort of getting into his career, you know, it's almost kind of fitting that Hellman, you know, his, you know, his last, you know, uh, you know, th that marking of 1989 where he makes a direct-to-video horror sequel, you know, it's kind of a fitting, if a if a kind of, you know, uh, un, uh, you know, like an unrewarded, you know, mm -hmm. an unrecognized... Unceremonious. Yeah, an unceremonious finale to a guy who really did begin his career in trash cinema. You know, it's like, and, 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 you know, it's like he, and he's in good company, though, because, you know, it's like Monty, Hel so, and that's the thing, the listener, you know, might be wondering, well, why Monty Hellman? Why are we uh, a monster movie podcast covering Monty Hellman? Well, I think the critical thing is, is that Monty Hellman is, I think, a good example of precisely a theme that we're constantly getting to on this podcast which is the ways in which a kind of legitimate fascinating artistic vision is often hiding behind the most deceptively juvenile or puerile or exploitative cynical forms of cinema and I think Hellman is a pretty much the premier example of someone who did begin in the 50s exploitation monster movies, but went on to demonstrate, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, to pull, appear back from behind the Iron Curtain of the, you know, the Saturday night drive-in B movie to reveal the true talent that was often hiding behind these films and often went unrecognized and unfulfilled. Uh, you know, like like a lot of his contemporaries, including, you know, directors Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Peter Bogdanovich, the screenwriter Robert Town, uh, who wrote Hal Ashby's The Last Detail and Roman Polanski's Ch Chinatown, the uh, director Nicholas Rogue, who began as a director of photography, of course, and actors like Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, and Bruce Dern. All of these are filmmakers, including Monty Hellman, who cut their teeth in what I think we can affectionately call the Roger Corman school of filmmaking. And this is very much a school of hard knocks. This is a school of exploitation a, of exploitation <laughs> of, of the artists as well. <laughs> right. We, you know, this is a school of you are fresh out of college. You are given a very limited assignment, both in terms of a budget and in terms of your shooting schedule, but also in terms of the latitude of what you're capable of doing, because you have a very simple cynical profit motive behind it but nonetheless you are being given an opportunity that it, that you're not likely to get anywhere else in the mainstream film industry you know and uh as far as you know so i guess maybe just a, a brief synopsis of hellman's biography up to meeting roger corman is appropriate so uh, he's born on July 12th, 1929, as Monty J. Himmelbaum. I think once he gets into the theater, he adopts the, his uh, his mother's maiden name, right. Hellman. Yes. Uh, he's born in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. His parents were actually just on vacation in New York. They had actually come from the Midwest. Uh, 
They settled in Albany, but they moved to California when Monty was around five or six years old. He takes up photography in high school. He graduates from Stanford University in 1951, and he then attended UCLA's film school, but only for about a year and a half. He drops out in 1953 because he decides he wants to travel Europe, and his first love is the theater. So when he comes back to America, he settles in California. He joins a summer stock company in San Francisco called the Stumptown Players. He serves as the troops director for three seasons before it goes under. He then gets a an editing apprenticeship at NBC. He he you know he ends up being so talented, and it turns out the workload at NBC for editors is so massive that he ends up being sort of unofficially promoted to assistant editor. He edits a few episodes of a uh, TV series called Medic, which was on TV from I believe around nineteen uh, fifty seven to about sixty or something thereabouts. Uh, this experience allows him to join the editor's union. He eventually quits editing and moves back to L.A. because he's still in love with the theater. And so he founds another theater company called the Theater Goers Company. But only a year into their existence, the Theater Goers Company, they fall apart in 1958 and mm. they're evicted from their performing space. At which time, one of the investors of the theater goers <laughs> yeah, company, go. <laughs> a, a, uh, a independent producer named Roger Corman, <laughs> he proposes to Hel- he proposes to Hellman that he should take the conversion of the theater by its owners into As a it, movie house. Right. That this is a basically a, a sign, sign from God. from God <laughs> that his true path is in filmmaking, and so Hellman basically takes up the first offer that Corman gives him. And now Corman is not just giving him an offer as an editor; he he recognizes that you know that this is a guy who has experience in writing and in direction as well as editing. And so Corman, he figures he can get a really good deal on a guy who can both serve as a sort of writer and a director and an editor all in one. Sounds like you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. uh, Someone who, yeah. Uh, So he ends up being offered the job directing a little movie written by Charles B. Griffith, a a long time, at this point, well, not a long time writer, but a guy who had written several movies movies for uh for roger corman in the past you know he ends up directing a movie called beast from haunted cave which corman and his brother gene corman shot back to back with corman's own ski troop attack in the black hills town of deadwood south dakota So this is what Hellman had to say about the project. He, Roger Corman, gave me this project and I started working with the writer Chuck Griffith and tried to at least transform it into something that was interesting to me. I had no interest in making a monster movie per se, but it was also a gangster movie. It was really Roger's version of Key Largo, which he's done about five times. I made the uh, best movie I could under the circumstances for $35,000. Now. I don't know, like, it's hard for me to find a definitive budget for the movie because he gives the estimated budget at around $35,000, which interesting is that the producer of the film, not the executive producer, Roger Corman executive produced the film, the producer of the film was Gene, Gene Corman, Corman right. his brother. Gene Corman in interviews gave the budget at $13,000. Huh. So I don't know if Hellman is referring to the combined budget of both Beast from Haunted Cave and Ski Troop Attack, mm. or if maybe this is maybe a case of like a, you know, a old B-movie producer who has realized that, you know, there's a there's a sort of legend that maybe he's kind of under selling how much the movie costs because it's a better story to say we did it for thirteen thousand dollars i'm not quite sure but i do have a you know one before we get into the the bones of beast from haunted cave i do want to just mention this one quote from uh gene corman about 
you know, th that anomaly, th what's, what seems like an anomaly to many Hollywood producers and to many historians and film critics, just the amazing uh, serendipity of so many great directors of photography, editors, directors, writers, and actors of the what is soon to be a renaissance, what is trumpeted, trumpeted as a revolution in American filmmaking coming up through the producer of such famous films as The Beast with a Million Eyes and It Conquered the Earth and Rock All Night and Day the World Ended. How does something like this happen? And I think this is actually a, a very, uh, a, a sort of a very ap appropriate quote from a Gene Corman as far as, you know, what leads that, you know, what produces a situation like this. You know, uh, this is an interview with the, his the film historian Tom Weaver. Gene Corman is quoted as saying, for the most part, a lot of the talent that Roger and I, Roger and I sponsored, I think that's a very interesting what phrasing for him to put it at, they sponsored the talent rather than they just paid them crappy wages to make their crappy movies. Uh, a lot of the talent that Roger and I sponsored was really germinated and brought about because we didn't have the financing that other companies had. Instead of the ability to write that check, we had to go out with the ability to recognize talent, and it worked out well for all of us. Just as a point, when science, we, serendipity, is a combination of two things. This is what I'm told. It's stupidity and serenity. Right. So if you just go with the flow and you're stupid enough to take something because you're whatever, you know, right. then it works out. I mean, so it's kind of interesting that the, the what the, uh, Roger Corman's legacy if you want to call it that. I mean, you have to hand it to him. Like, it's like a bunch, he, like of, it's bunch true. of baby spiders. They just feed off. I mean, look, <laughs> look, it, I'm sorry. It, it, I'm sorry. It has to be It has to be said. We've gone through a lot of, you know, in the, at least in the first season, we went through a lot of low budget 50s yes. movies. A lot. And it, what, what, what was inter yeah, yeah, what was interesting is that we had actually managed to ignore a lot of the Roger Corman and the American International Pictures movies. But as far as those B-movie producers, it has to be said that it, it was not the norm for these producers to necessarily find, you know, great future talent. You know, it, you know I think the closest we really came was when we were doing um, The Hideous Sun Demon. I was going to ask you, was we, that done with kids, though? Like well, right, kids? but, well, well, yeah, it's like, you know, it's... it's all, <laughs> But you see, shot on the weekend, right? Yeah, you you see the method. You hi, you hire a bunch of UCLA graduates who aren't being hired anywhere else to shoot a low budget movie because you know they're full. That's of, good because they're they're full of piss and vinegar and they really want to do something. <laughs> but it has to be. But you know, I think I think I do have to give Corman credit because you know, like it it's it would be one thing if you find like one good cinematographer. Or one good editor, right. or one good Again, writer, all together, right? But to and to have so many under your yeah. belt, you yeah. know, at a certain le and I think that's it's Corman's recognition. You think? Of this I think talent? it's Cor I think it's Corman's recognition, but I think it also speaks to what differentiates Corman so much as a producer is that, in as much as that he was a highly, highly brutally efficient businessman. He himself, I think, had aspirations of something more. I think Corman is a guy who, throughout his life, was always caught between his just deep sort of pathological instinct to never lose money, as well as his irrepressible desire, his irrepressible sort of long, you know, this sort of dream that he has that... Well, I'll just do these movies so that eventually I can get to a place where I can make something that's really personal to me. That never really happened for Corman. I mean, he made several very good movies, I think. I think the closest, but I think the closest that he ever made to like a really personal film was probably his Edgar Allan Poe movies, particularly uh, The Fall of the House of Usher and The Mask of the Red Death. 
But, you know, it's like, but it. I think that is the thing is that, like, I don't think Corman just goes to UCLA and to all of these, you know, these film school expatriates. I don't think he just does it because he can exploit a uh, pliable labor force. I think he also does it because he identifies with them yes. in a certain way. He's mm-hmm. like, you know, mm-hmm. I see you're interested in the same th- things I'm interested in. You know, it's like Corman very frequently will cite, you know, French cinema and German expressionist cinema. Like in particular, he was a big fan of like uh, silent cinema. Uh, he frequently cites Battleship Potemkin as a major influence on him as a filmmaker. Now, you may ask, well, where does the influence of Sergei Eisenstein show up in Roger Corman's movies? But that's the point, is that this is all ephemeral. And even if Roger Corman isn't the right guy at the right moment to sort of actualize his own vision, he is drawn like a magnet to the younger generation, the people who are maybe 10 or 20 years younger than him, who will have the opportunity to fulfill the promise of a truly strident and transformative and challenging independent cinema and as the se- and as the decades go on literally change the face of american cinema as we know it mm-hmm. do you want to just get into the synopsis yeah. of beast from haunted cave or before we get it? to the synopsis i want to point out to you how its origin how we got onto this film uh maybe two years ago yeah i saw frank wolf with a in a klaus kinski film like a western i think i don't know which one it was there were several that they did together and i think you were showing it i said that's i i never have not seen beast from the haunted cave for since i was a kid and i said that's the guy that's in beast of the haunted cave and i said we should watch beast of the haunt beast of haunted cave right right and uh, i can't remember if it was the great silence i think it must have been the great Silence. okay because yeah. what class is like a shooter like a well shooter. it takes place in the snow like that that's the way you know it it's like a deep barren sort yeah. of tundra anyway, in northern uh in and the that's North how Midwest. that's how yeah. it happened and when you showed me that film i said that guy in the same way that i said uh when i saw arch hall jr when i was trying to convince you of a film that i saw we couldn't put it together this horrible film that i loved so much but it was so deeply disturbing and we saw arch hall jr and so that's the kid that was in the movie i'm talking and you knew right away what the movie was the sadist yeah. the sadist yeah and, and, and that's how it works so when i saw i knew right away even though i haven't seen the film for since being a kid that i said that's the guy in beast of haunted beast of, of haunted cave and so that's why we came on this film but go ahead so, yeah, I've only seen Beast from Haunted Cave twice, and I I will get into – well, let me just get into the synopsis of it because then we'll be able to more thoroughly unpackage it because it is easily one of the more bizarre – and not in a very obvious way, but it is one of the more subtly bizarre of the 50s uh, B-monster movies. So, all right, so here we go. So we're in Deadwood, South Dakota, in the shadows of the Black Hill Mountain Range – a group of criminals plans a heist of the town bank's gold reserves. Our sordid cast includes Michael Forrest as black and mild smoking ringleader Alexander Ward, uh, Sheila Noonan as the rundown alcoholic mole Gypsy Boulay, Wally Campo as Byron Smith, a comic relief fi- figure, though I say comic relief in the scholarly rather than the effective sense. And finally, Richard Sinatra as Marty Jones. Sinatra is, in fact, the cousin of Frank Sinatra. And while I won't say he's a much better actor than his cousin, he does give the standout performance of the picture. And we'll probably get into the fact that when Hellman did some reshoots for the TV version of the film, he made the interesting decision to expand on Sinatra's performance. Uh, The plan is very simple. Marty will plant a time bomb in the local abandoned mine in order to act as a diversion for the heist. They will then be guided to a secluded mountain hideout by the unwitting, do-gooding himbo Gil Jackson, a ski instructor played by 
Michael Forrest. Wait, did I already say Michael Forrest? No, fuck me. I got this. You got it up. right. Michael Forrest is Gil Jackson. Right? Michael Forrest. Yeah, but who is playing uh, the Alexander Ward? Frank Wolf. Frank Wolf Frank played Wolf, it. Yeah, 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 sorry. I saw I fucked up. That's Frank right. Ward That's right. is playing Alexander Wolf, the, right. the, the bad guy. Gil Jackson is playing Michael Forrest, the ski instructor. So the night before the heist, Marty is supposed to set up the bomb, but he meets a barmaid named Natalie who he takes with him, and she is summarily killed by a strange creature living in the mine. Marty is visibly traumatized by the experience, but the heist the next morning goes off pretty much without a hitch, and they trek with Jackson up to his secluded mountain cabin. But lo and behold, the same creature seems to be stalking the group, and with an inclement winter storm rolling into the area, Ward's crew is furloughed with Gil getting suspicious, Gypsy looking to get out from under Ward's thumb, and Marty cracking under the pressure. You know what they say, in South Dakota, no one can hear you scream. As far as monster movies go, the... There is literally no attempt either on a logical or even just on an expositional level to really give the give a reason for why there is a monster in this heist movie. It is more or less just a heist movie with a monster in it, which was always intentional. And, you know, like uh, in an interview in Marquee magazine published in 1984, the screenwriter Charles Griffith, uh, Hellman in that other interview that I cited before, he mentioned that the movie was support basically supposed to be like Key Largo, but with a monster. And he Hellman mentions that uh, Corman had really done, you know, Key Largo several times before. And so uh, it, it, Griffith really gives testament to the same sort of thing here in this quote. So you see, we had set movies that we would do. One of them was Naked Paradise, which was made in 1956 about a robbery in a pineapple plantation in Hawaii, where the hero is operating a small sailboat and is hired by the crooks to take them to safety. When there is a robbery in Hawaii, the government shuts down the seaports and airports and nobody can get out. So that was the thing. The crooks hung around in the house waiting to be picked up while all the action happened and they all kill each other off. That was successful. So we did it again in South Dakota. Roger says, I want naked paradise using a gold mine instead of a pineapple pineapple plantation. Put it in South Dakota and add a monster. I didn't know how to add a monster to that script, so I had it all wrapped up in a cocoon in a cave just threatening to break loose all the time. I don't know how it happened. That became Beast from Haunted Cave. Really, when Hellman and Griffith are coming into this film, they're really given a very narrow parameter of what their job is. And as Hellman says in that quote, I, he really wasn't interested in making a monster movie. And I think that really bears out in Beast from Haunted Cave because the monster is almost incidental to the larger plot. I don't know. I mean, I've, we see movies before where you have a, a particular melodrama going on and out of nowhere you have a creature appear. But... Not really Almost out of nowhere. Oh, but inexplicably. It's not, not part of the film. It just happens to be part of the film. I'm just trying to think of one. But well, that's the thing. It's like, I, yeah. I don't, like I, that's the thing. I don't necessarily know that you're going to be able to because, like, you know, I think the closest we come to is, like, maybe, uh, what's the one with, fuck, I'm already forgetting all the movies we've watched, but it's the one where it's, like, by the lighthouse. The monster Piedras Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like... Yeah, that was terrible, I mean, that, Yeah, but that, but, mo that monster comes but out of nowhere, mouse, but, the, but there's a... The but quarter there, mass experiment but the, is an example. No, no, where... no, it's not. There's always... That's the... Th no, it's not. There's always a cornerstone of there being, like, a kind of organic explanation for why the monster is there. Right. And how it's there. I think it's interesting that you know, in, in, but un unintended consequences, right? I mean, it's, this is part of unintended consequences that, and I think it. I I agree what you're saying that, that that's how the, regardless of what the rationale is for doing the movie, which is to make a key Largo with a monster. Nevertheless, artistically, it comes off feeling organic. It doesn't I mean, come doesn't come off as a ruse or artifice. It just comes off. It feels organic. I mean, I think Hellman does what he can with the budget. Yes. He's very. I think he's very strategic about. 
I think also as a director of action, he definitely shows more kind of visual acuity than a lot of his contemporaries do. I think, I think, but as far as like the inclusion of the monster in the film, I think it, it does go with, without saying that like there is a kind of, even by the standards of these kinds of films, there is a lack of any sort of attempt at rational logical progression at least as far as the monster is concerned because the monster appears in a gold mine that is blown up at the beginning of the picture but then it suddenly goes into the and then suddenly when the characters are escaping up the black hills mountains it's suddenly there in the black hills mountains and we're really and there's really no it's, it's following them right I mean, that's the. I guess that's the, the, that's the conclusion that we have to come to is that it followed right. uh, Richard Sinatra's right. character, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he has and some of the eerie scenes where he's he's keeping Natalie as food, right? You see her webbed yeah. between two trees. I mean, there's some very eerie scenes that when you're a ten year old kid watching this movie, it it freaks you out. That's why I always remember it as being one of the more troubling uh, monster movies I've ever seen. Well, I think um, also the, and that's the thing, I think also the lack of rationale contributes to that. Absolutely. Because, you know, in order for this entire thing to work, basically the interior of the Black Hills Mountains needs to be like a kind of dream space where the monster, you know, almost in anticipation of like the modern slasher villain who the, mm -hmm. whenever they're not on screen, you can expect that they can basically teleport anywhere at any time. Mm -hmm. The Beast of Haunted Cave is this creature that uses the kind of liminal space of the interior of the mountain. Correct. And has this sort of foreboding power where it can just manifest itself anywhere. And people who are inside its domain, you know, it's very much an it's, you know, it, it's very cheap and kind of hokey looking to an adult. But if you're watching this late at night as a child in, you know, on TV mm -hmm. in the 60s, mm -hmm. it can be very disturbing to see, you know, just this woman in a cave, you have no real physical, there's no spatial relationship to where anything else is, but you know that she's just alone in a deep, hollow chasm. And the only thing keeping her, you know, for company is just this blood sucking monster. Right. right. And, you know, it, that is really just keeping her alive, you know, in order to feast upon her. It's like this very, you know, it taps into a just kind of primordial. Uh, fear almost you know it, it's just this deep this deep sense of powerlessness as opposed to a creature that that we see in other b movies where the monster simply kills people and it's kind of just indescript that person dies and they just disappear for the rest of the movie in the beast of haunted cave the victims of the monster are going to suffer a slow and agonizing demise. And in the case of Natalie, it's really for absolutely no reason. Well, other than food. Other than food. But <laughs> but but you know what I mean in yeah. terms of the fact. Yeah. And, you know, like, again, I like I can't I again, I can't help but thinking of like maybe like the sort of prototype it being a kind of prototype of the slasher movie, because basically Natalie's only sin is, you know, going off with this, you know, young man that she's never met before to have, you know, a sex outside of the context of marriage. So there's almost, there's almost a kind of like puritanical, like punishment element. Like this is, this is like a kind of just a deep chasm of hell. And this is where she is going to be spending the rest of eternity with this deep, this ghoulish thing. The monster itself is fairly disturbing looking. I mean, again, it's never really shown in full, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, it needs I mean, the spider element to it. Yeah, it's it's sort of like a con it's almost like a s combination of like a spider and like a a mummy cuz there's this there's this extent to which like num it, we only ever see it in very brief glimpses and most of the time it's just of its arms and its arms are like freaking huge like its arms are long enough that like you know it can just extend the full width of a wide shot in the frame and just pull a character off screen and not even you know obviously that's a function of the fact that the arms are completely separate from the actual <laughs> costume absolutely you know <laughs> I, I mean but like you know it, it, the the costume again yeah you're right you know it, it's sort of a 
the costume is incredibly cheap looking and hokey and not realistic, but at the same time, it's lack of realism. Mm -hmm. It's got this heart. It's got this nightmarish quality to it. Right. It's just, it's so, it's an, it's an extent to which where it's so artificial, but in an attempt to approximate something that it just looks even more distorted and unnerving. And, you know, I think it's a, you know, uh, I think it was... Uh, Chris Robinson. Yeah, Chris Robinson is the guy who designed the monster. Originally, um, Corman wanted Paul Blysdell, the guy who had designed uh, who had designed and played the monsters in numerous of Corman's and AIP's previous movies, including, you know, Day the World Ended, The She-Creature, Not of This Earth, you know... Uh, he was, it, Corman originally wanted him to make the monster, but the price tag proved to be so low that even Blysdell wouldn't do it. So Robinson comes on to create the monster and basically he just, uh, he's able to, uh, fashion the entire thing more or less out of like a chicken coop wire around a, fl- a plywood base with putty and crepe hair pasted to the exterior you know, it's this very, it's a very rigid, and and because it's so minimalist, again, it has a mummy skeleton like quality, and there's anthropomorphic aspects to it, but it's just so distorted and so. Mm-hmm. Well, you never see it on full screen. It looks like cousin it would that's having long arms. You yeah, know, but you, you never see it in full. But like no. the the sort of impressions that you're given of it are enough that like you know. And I guess it's it's again it's kind of a perfect combination of the familiar and the unfamiliar because you could easily see it as being like a witch or something like that. You know, there's a sort of a- aspect of it that may you know it has like almost it almost like has like a a weirdly kind of dark feminine quality to it. They do find an egg, right? And Marty, Marty tries to tell Alexander or Alex the story, right? And he says that there was, when I was in there with the thing that got Natalie, I saw pieces of a shell. He says, maybe that thing's been sitting there for millions of years right. until the miners came in and over time had awakened it. Um, it's kind of, it's very interesting. I mean, he does try to give an explanation uh, and Ward's, Alexander Ward's reply is even equally funny, but, you know, but typical, you know, uh, as you say, over almost like a exaggerated uh, crime boss kind of. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned that. And it's in a way it, it is like that. I mean, that's or the thing. Does, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that's, the th- you know, that that's the thing about Charles Griffith screenwriting is that, you know, like as far as like be the sort of independent B movie writers, he is sort of more revered than others, not necessarily because the mo- the scripts he writes are good per se, but he does have a a, a sort of natural uh, uh, talent or a panache, we should say, with writing dialogue that is punchy and snappy and that more or less, you know, great for like a B-movie filmmaker kind of approximates what you imagine would be the writing of a real movie that, you know, a script that didn't have to be cranked out in a month or even a couple of weeks or something. So there is this extent to which that the, again, like I won't say like the performances of the movie are necessarily great. Again, I do think uh, Richard Sinatra does give the standout performance, but that seems to be more because, like, of all the (laughs) actors in the movie, he is definitely on some kind of, like, Marlon Brando or James Dean-esque, like, method trip. Whatever. I mean, the idea is it's hard to tell, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's a, again, like, and that's the thing. It's hard to put into words why it's so bizarre, but I think. A lot of it has to do with the, the way it's shot. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's it's Hellman's fingerprint on it, right? I think part of it is Hellman's fingerprint, but I like I think part of it is also accidental. Like the reason that Gene Corman wanted to shoot the movies, uh, the movie in South Dakota was really just because you know he had basically. Uh, he and his brother had basically just gotten sick of shooting movies in the Bronson Canyon and in the Ar- the Arboretum, you know, like that was where they shot most of their monster movies just because it was a cheap place to do it. And they were like, all right, we need a change of scenery. Why don't we go to the Black Hills? 
But the thing about shooting in the Black Hills and, you know, Corman uh, talks about Gene Corman has uh, talks about this. I have another quote for him. He's you know, like he wants to go to the Black Hills because it's this very beautiful, very open, very scenic place. It's very different from anything any other B movie makers are doing. But then he says, once we got there, we found that the Black Hills were such that visually you couldn't hold them. They're wonderful if you're standing five miles away, but once you're down there close, you're always in shade and it just didn't seem to work as well as I had hoped. And I think that is reflected in the visual aesthetic of the movie because the, here's the thing, the complicated thing about shooting not just in a mountain range, but in a landscape that's covered in snow. snow. White, it, yeah, because yeah, wh- white is a ref- pure white. Snow is highly reflective. So if you're going to be shooting in snow, you have to, uh, you have to always, in order to get a balanced, uh, a image into reflected into the lens of your camera to expose the uh film to reflect a a balanced sort of light range you have to deliberately uh underexpose it so you have to deliberately close the aperture of your camera a stop or maybe even two stops lower than you normally would so a consequence of that is, you know, so the part of the consequence of that is, is that you're making that compensation for the snow. So now all of the blacks in your scene are that much blacker. You So there's already, so despite the fact that you're closed aperture, it should be giving you a deeper focus. It should be giving you a deeper depth mm-hmm. of field, a mm-hmm. deeper clarity because so much more of the scene is now crushed into black, there's actually less detail. There's actually an almost like an opaque, foggy muddiness to the image. And what makes that even worse is the fact that, you know, that weird contradiction where it's exactly what Gene Corman is talking about is that despite the fact that so much light is being reflected off the snow, once you're actually in that mountain range and you're surrounded by these trees, the thing you realize is that there really isn't a lot of dynamic natural light because you've either got peaks on all sides, you've got these trees, you know, you are constantly being put into shadow. Right. And not only that, so you're, so there's this almost like this weird haze. So rather than a kind of dynamic range, you're actually getting a kind of weird, unnatural diffusion of the light, which I think in one way it makes the film look genuinely kind of, you know, shoddy and amateurishly done. But in another weird way, when it's juxtaposed with all of like the, you know, the sort of decisions that Griffith and Hellman are forced to make, I think it does sort of contribute to its kind of it's kind of nightmare like mm-hmm. quality, mm-hmm. I think in mm-hmm. certain ways or the, or the sense of danger right. or the sense of, um, it reminds you of a bad dream when you're trying to get away from something. Yeah. It gives you that kind of feeling. And I think that's what, that's what sticks with me in the movie. It's it, it no matter what they're doing, it, you can almost feel it. They, they're, they show long sequences of them skiing or trying to do cross country skiing to the, to the cabin. Right. Um, and it feels like they're not making any headway against this creature behind right. them. It's a, no, it, it just it seems to work. But I do the other thing was the cold, right? It was supposed to be really. Something they were talking yeah, about. Yeah, it must, have been, it must have been absolutely miserable to shoot this. And thing, was, but... wasn't it like some of the equipment froze up on him, and then Corman was raising holy hell because they lost the day of shooting or something like that at the beginning or something like that. Where I forget where I read that. I mean, um, I bet, I imagine something like that. Like they were obviously not prepared to be shooting in a a a, a cold midwestern environment after shooting for years in sunny. California like yeah, you know like it was they were completely out of their depth and that is the weird thing is like you're right like it's almost like the 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 falsity of the movie makes it kind of it, it makes it fu- kind of impossible to identify with it in a conventional sense even by the low standards of these kind of low budget movies Beast from Haunted Cave is a movie that is so unprepared for what it is attempting to do that there's no that that it's impossible for you like subconsciously 
to attach what is occurring on screen to, you know, the sort of schematic references you've built up in your mind of how movies are supposed to go. But at the same time, that that falseness itself becomes weirdly just just kind of gross and mm-hmm. disturbing mm-hmm. And, it, yeah. and and you and so i think that does allow certain aspects of the movie to shine through and that's the thing is that it, i think it, we should mention that there are actually two versions of beast from haunted cave the first is the version that we saw for this episode which is the version that was shown in theaters as a double feature with various movies including uh the wasp woman when Corman was taking these films and he was preparing them for packages that he was going to sell to television, what he ended up doing was that he hired Hellman to shoot additional sequences for the film so that he could est- extend the running time for the movie so that they would fit the time slots for mm-hmm. American broadcast television in terms of being able to be split up to have commercial breaks. And so there is a second version of this film, and both of them are available on streaming. Like, I believe the one that's available on Tubi and the one that's available on DVD, most DVD copies that are available now is the theatrical version but the one that's available on Amazon Prime is the DV is the TV version with 10 minutes of additional footage that was more or less Roger Corman just says to Hellman look I just need 10 minutes of more footage here's some money here's a few of the returning cast members just go and shoot whatever the hell you want it really doesn't matter and so I think what's interesting is that the TV version of the film of all of the things that Hellman chooses to put into the film, it has nothing to do with the monster. The first important thing he does is he makes a cool little stakeout scene between uh, Richard Sinatra's character and our comedy relief in the form of Byron Smith. We just have them staking out the bank, driving around the town before they, pictures. yeah, before they go, before they go back to the ski resort where they're staying. Yeah. A nice little way to establish a kind of, you know, tension, but then the two other scenes he adds are not even are not anything that contributes to or advances the plot. They are all to expand on Marty Jones's character, the character who is the thug henchman played by Richard Sinatra. And it's a very weird choice. And I, I just have a clip here which just gives a sort of impression of the sort of stuff that Hellman added to the movie as far as the expansion of the uh, of Richard Sinatra's part in it. What's your name? Jill. Well, how do you do? My name's Jack. <laughs> oh, really? No, I was only kidding. It's Marty. How long have you been here? All my life. No, I mean here at the ski shop. I started this year. You've never skied before? Oh, yeah, I've skied. I've been just, you know, kind of brushing up. It's funny, every time I look at you, I smile. Hmm. Did I tell you I knitted this sweater? It's a great color. What is it? Cedar brown. Funky color. Will you knit me one? (laughs) You'll have to get in line. I mean, you like to knit. Is that your scene? I like to do things with my hands. I'm going to take up painting when I get the nerve. See, all you have to do is to start painting. But I don't know anything about it. Well, you don't have to know anything about it. All you have to do is to do it. Well, who knew anything when they first started painting? What if it's bad? Well, it's not bad or good. If it's what you like to do, do it. Really? I wish I had known that about six years ago. I wanted to do something, but I was afraid. You shouldn't smoke, you know. It's bad for your lungs. How, how old are you? <laughs> I don't like to tell. How old do you think I am? Twenty. Nineteen. How old are you? How old do you think I am? <laughs> Twenty-five. Twenty-seven. Uh, you're not married, are you? No. Would you like to have dinner? I don't know you. 
Have you got a boyfriend? No. I have to cook dinner every night for my brother. Well, that's okay. I'll give him a quarter to go to the movies. All right. So that was two minutes of screen time. And now, again, I have to stress for my listener, two minutes may not sound like a long time. But in the context of a 70-minute movie, two minutes is forever. And yeah. it, I, I, it, was, it, it showed the... And it goes on from there. There's more to that scene. Right. He, there's a there's a Gil scene too, right? Where he's yeah. There's just, a there's right? another scene w- later in the movie yeah. during the climax, w- right when Marty is like really starting to crack up, where we actually see an expansion on what he talks about in that scene, where he's talking about how like you know there was a time in my life that I wish I had known that if I wanted to do something, I just had to do it. Right. And then later on, he's asking Gil, you know, after he's sort of been through this traumatic experience, after he's cracking up, after he knows that this monster is after them. And he thinks after him because he's the one who witnessed the monster killing Natalie and he's the one who has this sort of special knowledge of the creature's existence. There's just this extended single shot conversation between him and Gil just about Gil's job working at a ski shop and just asking him, like, you know, it's like, are you happy doing what you do? Like, how, d- does it what, pay the bills? Yeah, does it pay the bills? Mm-hmm. Is it something that anybody can just pick up? And it's just like, it's of all the things it's to very put inane, in the movie. It, I think it try, they're trying to humanize him. Uh, yeah. but, and it would be an interesting contrapuntal to, to, uh, to Alexander Ward, who also engages Gil in a conversation within the house. He says... Do you like it up here? He said, "Yeah." I said, "What do you yeah. do? Well, you you don't like the city? Oh, I've been to the city. I've been to San Francisco. Oh, you didn't like? It? Oh, no, it was fantastic. It just wasn't for me." He said, "What do you do here? Oh, I could usually read. I just pick up the encyclopedia. Usually, there's something new about it on every page." They're trying to show the contrapuntal between him and Marty because Marty that would affect him. He would right. understand it because we get a sense that Marty doesn't. He fell into this life because he didn't follow his dreams, and then he got sucked maybe, into You know, maybe he grew up in a bad environment. Right, whatever. Maybe, yeah, he but may it, get... But it, like, the, it doesn't the, work. The point, it does the, not work. Well, well I mean... It, it, it doesn't. I don't know... It if, works a little it, bit, it, it but it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't yeah, work, but, yeah, like, you know, yeah. the point is... I get the attempt, though. Yeah, you see, like, there's this po- attempt to communicate not only that Marty has a chance, but something that really has no chance to be developed in the movie, which is that secretly Marty is the protagonist of this film. Right. That the that thematically speaking, Marty is at the center of everything that happens. Correct. Marty is the creature who has to plant the bomb. He is the he is the essential point man right. in this entire heist. He, right, because Campo's an asshole. Actually, yeah, Cam- I'm sorry. Campo's a dumb. He's, yeah, Campo's dumb, and Campo is basically like a, a man child. Like there's an there's an entire like. Oh, forget about the he's snow a, dove. I mean, <laughs> he, yeah, he, there. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, it, it like unfortunately the most similar the way that this movie is the most similar to Key Largo is offensive Native American <laughs> representations. There's a uh, Native American character played by uh, Kay Jennings called Small Dove. Who, Small Dove or Snow. Dove. Small dove, okay, thank is, you. and it's a joke because she's a big old fat lady. Uh, well, she's not real big, but she's fat. Well, yeah. I, but not look, real fat. Look, the point. I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that this is offensive all around. <laughs> it, it's misogynistic. It's racist, and also she's Gil Jackson's mute maid. And there's also like not a, mute. She speaks. She sp- Rocco. Can you not be so goddamn literal? I mean that like uh, it's the stereotype of the silent right engine right you know right, like that right. that's the thing i'm getting at here yeah. and you know she's gil jackson's maid and his cook but she like develops like a quasi kind of okay. romantic relationship with wally campo's character it's like this whole comic relief thing it's offensive and it serves no purpose and it's gen uh, genuinely the worst thing about the film yeah, it like, is. like it uh, is. uh like charles b griffith is a pretty good at affecting a kind of B noir punchy sort of style of dialogue. He is terrible at comic relief. He has no ear for comedy. Uh, the so you have that aspect of it, but more or less you ha- are in this situation where Marty Jones is this character who, especially in the TV version, and I guess we would have to admit that simply because Hellman was responsible individually for more of the TV version, 
that in a weird sort of aborted way, it's closer to whatever vision he could have had. You know, this is the movie of a character who falls into this life of crime because he gives up, you know, when life gets too hard, he gives up on the potential that he could have had to be a better person, to be his own boss, to be his own man, to be, you know, to be a productive member of society. And then inevitably it comes to a head where he's about to pull off this big crime, this big moment, and then someone in who he just picks up at a bar who he didn't mean to get hurt dies because of his actions. And so the entire movie then becomes about the monster is really kind of a manifestation of his guilt in that sort of way. Mm. The you know the story is you know in as unbalanced as it is with this constant focus on Gil Jackson and his you know the love the sort of developing love affair he's having with Gypsy and you know Alexander Ward trying to like you know one up this re, you know the dichotomy between Alexander Ward who is sort of this you know affected masculine guy versus Gil Jackson who is like a real man and all this stuff all of this unbalancing stuff is fundamentally kind of distracting from something that Bill Warren notes in his book Keep Watching the Skies which is that really this is a movie that is all about Marty Jones this is all about a man who makes mistakes and is sort of pursued by the embodiment of his guilt and notably the climax of the movie which is very anticlimactic it is not Gil Jackson, the sort of the sort of conventional, traditional masculine hero. It is Marty Jones who ultimately kills the monster with a flare and sacrifices himself in the project process. And then once that happens, we don't then cut back to Gil Jackson and Gypsy in order to emphasize then they lived happily ever after. Once Marty Jones dies, the movie just comes abruptly to a halt. Right. It ends. Yeah, it just reinforces the idea that this is what the film is actually about. Right. It's a morality play in yeah. many ways. Yeah. Yep. So, and I think it is interesting because obviously this is a very sort of, uh, this is obviously not a full picture of what Hellman's, you know, artistic vision, you know, this is not a free artistic project for Hellman. But at the same time, having seen more of his films, it is kind of interesting how we are already seeing, even if it's just accidental, themes that are going to reappear in his later films. Like, I think it's impossible to not note the, not only the thematic, but the weird sort of, uh, the kind of ephemeral parallels between Beast from Haunted Cave and The Shooting which I think we also had come to the conclusion is another movie that sort of lacks a really rigid, coherent narrative logic to it, but is explicable if you understand it as being the story of a man who is pursued by his guilt to his own destruction. I think we also see something that is also going to become part a persistent theme of uh, Hellman's movies, which is the sort of abs which is of absurdism. And I don't mean absurd as uh, absurdism in the sense of comic absurdism. I mean absurdism in the sense of Albert Camus in this in the sort of sense of this Sisyphean struggle that human beings engage in to try to either to do anything to try to affect a kind of meaning in their life in a cold and uncaring universe mm. only for again like the story of sisyphus for the boulder to then just roll back down the hill and the struggle to assert meaning to just sort of continue endlessly i think that's what we see in marty marty is a guy who mm. is you know is you know, it, in his journey, like, again, like Sisyphus, he is journeying up a mountain. And this movie is sort of about his own Sisyphean struggle to try to make something of himself, to pay penance for his actions. Mm. Uh, I th the other thing I'd like to mention is that, and, and maybe not so much, in, maybe not so much in this film, but, and, 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 is it it's 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 Hellman's ability to and probably you'll see this more in in our next series with on Marty Hellman, um, but certainly 
his use of the physical space, not as scenery, but almost as if it has a life of its own. It's, yeah. it's he's able to like the even I don't know how he does it, but the idea is, is that maybe because he spends more time on the structure of the physical space. That's the thing. It's like, like, I think it's okay that it doesn't make sense because like, you know, even in this kind of compromised form, it speaks to the kind of, po- it speaks to the poetry, you know, it speaks to the poetry of Hellman's filmmaking. Right. Like even at this early stage, you know, like he says in that quote, I was just trying to make something that was interesting to me. So, so in this sort of low stakes context where he knows that, okay, I do need to kind of just make a kind of juvenile gangster slash monster movie. But in the meantime, I have a lot of latitude to just do what is interesting to me. And so that's what you get with beast from haunted cave. It really is just a series of interesting sequences, not good, but it's not, but like, it's almost, it, it reaches a point where it's like, Is it even fair to judge Beast from Haunted Cave on levels of, like, conventional quality? Because it's so not like a conventional good movie, but it's also so unlike a lot of the B-horror movies that we've seen. It is so different. Like, you know, the B-horror movies that we've seen before... If the director had the opportunity to add something to the story, he probably wouldn't add an extended, you know, three minute scene of your of a who is supposed to be Marty Jones, who is supposed to be a supporting character in the story, having a, you know, flirting with a girl who is not going to appear for the rest of the picture and it doesn't advance the plot in any way like you're already seeing like the window into Hellman's very idiosyncratic way of doing things. And I think comparatively his filmmaking here is much more promising, I think than a lot of the other filmmakers who came up in the sort of Roger Corman school Hmm. as it was. Okay. So here's the deal. We've been going for an hour and a half. So we, (laughs) It's 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 so mind boggling because I really did think that we would have time to do both Beast from Haunted Cave and Backdoor to Hell in a single episode. Because here was the original plan. The original plan was me and dad were going to do Beast from Haunted Cave and Backdoor to Hell for a free episode. Then we were going to do a patron only episode for the shooting, Ride in the Whirlwind and Two Lane Blacktop. But... I mean, we're already an hour and a half into it, and we've only just done Beast from Haunted Cave. I think it's safe to say that we're probably going to have to take these movies one at a time, because there's just a lot to talk right. about with each of them, and I don't know yeah. how you feel about I it. I do. Like, would you, do you I think do. it's worth it? Yeah, because I think that now we're going to go into a more realistically... Now we're going to see, the, we're going to see in the um, Backdoor to Hell... Um, we're going to see more of the artistic talent without this superficial kinds of problems that you have with this movie. You're going to see yeah. something that's... I mean, there will still be superficial problems, but they will be more interest. Even the superficial well, problems, filled, yeah. even the compromises will be more interesting. Yes. They will be less amateurish compromises yes. and more, you know... Uh, like, there will be more conflict in the compromises between uh, Hellman's artistic vin- vision and the cynical motivations of the people yeah. who are giving him the money. Yep. Uh, yeah, but like, so yeah, I think we'll still keep the Beast from Haunted Cave and Backdoor to Hell episodes free. Then when we do Hellman's Westerns and of course Two Lane Blacktop, those will all be patron exclusives. Uh, but yeah, join us next time. We will try to record the next uh, episode as soon as possible. We'll probably just be releasing these episodes throughout the rest of the month, you know, considering that we have five films to do. That's definitely, you know four weeks at least work of movies i guess the second season is beginning prematurely again but uh anyway that was beast from haunted cave please join us on the next episode of monster craze memoirs this between again continuation of monty hellman right yeah the, yep. in continuation of our in memoriam for monty hellman where we review his low budget war film starring Jack Nicholson and produ- co-produced with Jack Nicholson, a young Jack Nicholson, Back Door to Hell. Where is he? 
Point of curiosity, are they our friends or are we their prisoners? What difference does it make? What difference does it make? Yeah, we're all gonna die anyway. Tomorrow, next week, 30 years from now. Did that little thought ever penetrate your thick skull? Yeah, once when I was a boy, but naturally I dismissed it as being too outrageous. Mm -hmm. 